uh, in my experience, have for a long time understood that many of the challenges confronting us are political in origin. Uh, they, they don't, nothing happens by accident. Uh, I, I got this very clear when a chief economist in the World Bank in 1991 wrote an internal memo that, um, that underpopulated African countries are vastly underpolluted. He said that underpopulated African countries are underpolluted and therefore it makes economic sense to dump pollution in those countries. So Sweden shipping west to Pinochet in Chile or any other country shipping pollution to an African country or Asian or Latin American country is all political decision. And this is the way I now understand what corporations do when they're extracting uh, nature's gifts, when they're extracting mineral. In the new extractivism, it's just that you can externalize all the environmental costs, all the social costs, all the costs related to all the degradation and get away with it because it's just politically right, it's economically right to do that. Because if you don't pay the environmental cost, if you don't consider remediation at the end of the day, of course you don't have to worry about anything but just to pile up your profit. And, and, and a man like that, I mean, and like the chief economist, goes ahead to be an advisor to presidents in the United States, advisors to people who ought to be listening, and he, just, he says that in territories where people don't live to 65 years or live to have prostate, prostate cancer, it is okay to dump waste and kill them off because it doesn't make any difference. I mean, when human lives are dispensed of in this manner, that is really something that we need to fight against. That's something we really need to struggle. So when we, when we look at the ecological degradation, we are looking at the fundamental where the politics hits people in real life. Hits the social life of people, hits economic life, and hits people on, in every dimension. Now, let me, let me just give you an, a, a glimpse of what oil companies have achieved. I have had a disadvantage or the unfortunate uh, situation of visiting communities in many parts of the world just to see the degradation caused by transnational corporations. And I'm yet to see one, not even one, where they've done well at the place where they extract and exploit resources. I've not seen any. And I'm not looking forward to seeing any because I believe that we should all say yes to life and no to mining. The world has mined enough. A lot of the gold that's being extracted today are being dumped, kept in vaults in banks. They're being kept as value, whereas they're not adding anything to any value. They're not being used for anything. So companies keep extracting things that are not being used for anything rather than using what has already been extracted. And so for any of us who stands for life, we also should stand against mining any kind of mining. Enough is enough. Now, so can you say with me, yes to life. Yes to life. Yes to life. No to mining. You are excellent. <laughs> but let me just tell you what, what the oil companies have done in a part of Nigeria called Ogoni land. I became an activist on environmental issues because, because Shell connived the Nigerian government to kill a key environmental activist in Nigeria whose name is Ken Sarawiwa. Some of you must have heard about Ken Sarawiwa. He was executed on... He was executed on 10th November 1995 because he campaigned against shell pollution of his communities and demanded for a cleanup. Now, by 2011, the United Nations Environment Program issued, studied the environment of Ogoni and issued a report. And that report showed that in some places in Ogoni land, the soil is polluted to a depth of five meters, five meters with hydrocarbons, contaminated completely. And that the groundwater is contaminated with benzene 
about 900 times more than acceptable level by the World Health Organization. Now, this report was published in 2011. In late 2017, when the cleanup, the attempt to clean up this territory started, the, the soil was excavated in a place where we were told that the pollution was down to a depth of five meters, and we found that the pollution has now gone to seven meters. In other words, for every one day, the pollution is getting more complicated and getting worse. And now, what has, what has the corporation done about this? They put up signposts in communities, contaminated land, keep off, right in the middle of villages where people are living, right where they're farming. You, you are being told that this is contaminated, they should keep away. Of course, everyone knows that it's contaminated. And everybody knows that the sensible thing to do is to move. But sometimes it's not about what is sensible, it's about what is practical. And so if you're going to move all 1 million people from a territory contaminated by an oil company so that they can keep making profit, that doesn't make sense at all. It's easier for me to kick the corporations away from the territory and continue with the cleanup process. This is what the Ogoni people did. This is what Ken Sarawiwa did, and that is why he was killed. But the struggle has not ended because the leader of the movement was taken away. And this, to me, it shows the underpinning, the underpinning essential of movement building and struggle. That we don't have one leader who leads a movement and then is arrested or locked up or killed and then everything stops. We all must move forward as leaders. If they take this man off, I take his place. Take one person off, 20 others take the place. This way the system can never defeat us. You know the saying, a people united can never be defeated. It's true. It's not just a slogan. When we are united, we stand together. We say enough is enough of the degradation. Enough is enough of taking away the fundamentals of my life. I mean, just think about it. I can't stop talking about oil completely. When I think about oil, my blood boils. And I just look at Sometimes I want to be charitable. I said, okay, let's compare the economics of oil and nature, for example. Oil and fishing, for example. In a place like Ghana, in West Africa, the fisheries industry brings in about, about 1 billion US dollars every year. And most of the fishers are artisanal fishers, they are small scale fishers in small boats. Now they've started the ex extracting oil from Ghana and they've started having pollution in the waters. And they've started, the, the military have cut off the fishers from certain places because they have to secure the oil equipment. And this is the problem. Wherever governments depend on extractivism, they protect the facilities of transnational corporations more than the citizens. The military is hired and assigned to protect pipelines, to protect oil rigs, and not to protect the citizens. But the oil industry in Ghana does not bring in $1 billion a year. Does not employ thousands of people in that country. But thousands are losing their jobs, losing livelihoods, because the sources of livelihood is being contaminated by corporate misbehavior. And so, it is extremely difficult to divorce, to divorce the reckless behavior of corporations from the destruction or the basis of life of people. And what's the solution? Simple. We have to respect the right of Mother Earth. Without globally accepting the right of Mother Earth is as important and if it's the basis for the enforcement of human rights, then we can never win the struggle. Nature speaks to us every day. Are we listening to what nature is saying? The soil speaks, the sky speaks, the waters speak. Are we listening to what nature is saying? We've heard about land grabs. Now they're grabbing the sea through the blue economy. Have we heard about the blue economy? Does it not sound nice, blue economy? But it's all about exploiting what nature has given us in the seas. About deep sea mining, 
about trawlers, trawlers taking away everything, both needed and not needed. And now we're also being threatened with the sky grab. Have you heard about the sky grab? 80% of the sky has been grabbed by carbon. So the remaining carbon budget is what the struggle about climate change is all about. The sky has been grabbed. And now to fight to preserve the 20% that is remaining, people are telling us we can't do, we can't solve climate change except to use technology. And what is this technology? Putting mirrors in the sky, putting shades in the sky, whitening the clouds, fertilizing the oceans to absorb more carbon, making artificial trees that would take more carbon out of the air, whitening the, the snow, covering forests with plastics that are white so as to reflect more heat in the atmosphere. If we allow sky grab to, com to complicate the situation as we've allowed land grab, then I think we may have to look for another planet B. But unfortunately, there's no planet B.